My work uh, deals with surveillance, but also with privacy and art and fashion. Surveillance, I think, is a popular topic to frame it. So I'm, uh, if you see something and you want to say something, uh, you can do that on Twitter, and that's where I am. The way that I like to describe the work that I do is existing somewhere between these three overlapping areas of interest. So within each one, uh, there are a lot of subcategories, like drones within defense. And within privacy, there are many subtopics that uh, could be discussed, like digital privacy, encryption, um, Tor. And there's a more interesting one on the other side. And it's often not brought into the mix of defense and privacy. But I think there are some important similarities and overlapping areas between um, what we commonly think of as fashion and these other two uh, very large industries. That little white dot in the middle is something I call the privacy gift shop. It's a real thing. I came up with this uh, proposal last year and introduced the idea to a curator at the New Museum and uh, within a few months, it became a reality as a pop-up uh, store at the New Museum. Uh, what was great is that you could pay cash at the pop-up store for some counter-surveillance items that I've worked on. I'm going to talk a lot about surveillance and privacy. And these are words that get thrown around a lot. And they have many different meanings uh, to different people. For example, I recently met somebody uh, who speaks Beng uh, Bengalese. And he told me that privacy doesn't even exist. There's no word for it in his language. And when I talk about surveillance and privacy, I talk about them and think about them in their relationship to power. Everybody needs surveillance, and surveillance is something that can benefit everybody. There's no sense attaching this word to uh, positive or negative when it's sort of uh, camouflaging, I think, what's really uh, the matter at stake, which is who's in control, uh, who has control over access to information and the tools to acquire it, and who has uh, privilege or access to that stored information that they can use for further information processing. Likewise, <clears throat> privacy is just about power, too. In this quote from the Cypherpunk Manifesto, I think it's aptly described as the power to selectively reveal parts of yourself to the world. In uh, some forms of propaganda, privacy is described as um, some kind of suspicious activity where um, it's supposed that you'd have something to hide. Uh, maybe you're guilty of committing a crime, and that's why you need privacy. Uh, but I think of it in terms of power, and when you have privacy, you are empowered. Getting back to the similarity between the defense industry and fashion, uh, some of the similarities that I see between these two worlds is that they both heavily rely on trends, trend forecasting, insights, and intelligence is as useful to the fashion industry as it is to the defense industry. Um, but I'm talking about a specific part of the defense industry, which is the surveillance. If you compare the size of these industries, um, which one do you think, I'm talking about surveillance, but fashion compared to surveillance, it's about 350 billion spent annually on fashion and 13 billion on the surveillance industry. So there's so much um, innovation happening in fashion. And unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, fast fashion, uh, just made to quickly replace items on the shelf to keep introducing new items to consumers. But I see uh, an interesting way for fashion to be used as a kind of tool against surveillance, because what surveillance wants is conformity. And what fashion is, by nature, is non-conforming. Fashion is always changing, and this idea uh, that you have to stay one season ahead of the latest trends kind of applies to counter surveillance in the same way that you need to stay one season ahead of the latest algorithms. 
Also, they both rely on models of deception. A uh, slide from a conference I attended, attended in 2012 about spoofing and anti-spoofing was um, there was a researcher, Anders Sandberg, from Oxford, and he presented this slide, which made a big impact on me. This slide talks about the cost of surveillance and how it's not always an ethical issue whether to surveil or not. It's a cost-benefit analysis. And when the cost of surveillance reaches such a um, small amount, then it makes sense to carry that out on a very wide scale. This is exactly what's been happening with mass surveillance, dragnet-style surveillance. Uh, to break this slide down a little bit, what it's basically saying is at some point, the cost to surveil an entire population of a country um, will be efficiently done for you know, a fraction of the GDP, and it makes economic sense to do that. To put that slide in perspective, the uh, estimated cost to surveil you per day, um, speaking here about people in the United States, is, has been guessed at 19 cents by the guy on the right who has um, comp calculated his cost to $16,000 per day in the UK. That's a massive amount of money to be spent surveilling one person. And he's very interesting, of course. Uh, it makes sense in that case. In this case, it's really unfortunate that the tools have become so cheap that the decision is merely a cost-benefit analysis. And at 19 cents per day, it's an easy decision to make. So the way I see fashion working as counter-surveillance is by increasing that cost. When you start to become uh, less conforming to the standards that surveillance expects from you, then you can drive that cost up. And I'll show you some projects that have explored this idea. For me, it all started with this uh, big change in the way photography was happening. And I hardly even think of photography as photography anymore. Um, it's really the art of surveillance. But when I was studying photography in school, it was, at that time, film. And that meant that you can only take so many photos because it gets expensive. Especially as a student, you're limited uh, to how much film you can buy, and the developer to uh, develop all those photos really adds up. When that film is stored on an SD card, uh, you can shoot, instead of two or three rolls, uh, 36, 72 images, you can shoot hundreds. And as these cards got bigger, you could shoot thousands. So what happened um, is that we went from using a kind of uh, single shot or semi-automatic type uh, camera to nearly these fully automated types of cameras. And with that, brought this kind of uh, vulgar, um, violent tendencies out of paparazzi photographers being able to um, kind of predatorialize victims at uh, 7, 10 frames per second at 10 megapixels is kind of a, a threatening type of activity. And we call photography art, but this is clearly uh, not art anymore. Uh, this is an example of, I think, Britney Spears being attacked by paparazzi. So in 2009, I had this idea that I would make something that would make photography more interesting. Because I, while I'm not, I wasn't that far, but I was doing party photography and fashion photography. And I felt like a lot of people were just getting sick of party photographers. This was also the time, maybe some people remember uh, Merlin Bronx from last night's party.com. A lot of great photography, but also uh, the way that it was presented, this was now 2004, 2005, is that all of these great party photos, uh, they're published online and they stay there forever. So while you're having fun one night and somebody takes a photo, that's now available to the world forever for analysis, um, also in an automated manner. So my idea was, it's clearly um, 
the power is all in the hands of people who have the technology. And photography is not that interesting anymore. What if you could give power back to the person on the other side of that lens? And I envisioned the anti-paparazzi clutch, which was a prototype, a um, bunch of circuitry stuffed in a bag with some bright LEDs and batteries that would activate like a slave flash and overexpose a photographer's photo. Uh, not only is it fun to fire back, but it makes it more of a game. It makes photography actually a little bit more of a challenge and more interesting images at the end. <clears throat> That ended up on Perez Hilton's site with Lindsay Lohan and, uh, um, and one of his little quippy statements. After that was published, I received an email, which was my first hate mail, and I was really excited <laughs> about receiving this because uh, these people, paparazzi, are, in my mind, scum, and I was so excited that they were getting angry by this. Uh, clearly, if it weren't effective, then he wouldn't be writing me. <laughs> but I'm potentially reducing his family's income. So a really <laughs> heartfelt email. <laughs> I'm going to show you a demo of how this works. This is, of course, a black box prototype for uh, the second version. So it's kind of big, but you know, it could be reduced and improved. Yeah, so it's pretty bright. <laughs> this is the LED array, and at the time it's using the highest end LEDs. Uh, it's half a thousand dollars worth of LEDs, and the lenses and the circuitry inside. It's quite an expensive project to develop, but I think um, there are certain people who would want it. So hopefully that project does come out of the prototyping stage and into the real world, which is when I think art projects become much more exciting. After working on that project and really inspired by the hate mail I had received, I began thinking about other ways to make photography more interesting. Now, between the decade of 2000 to 2010, we saw the camera transform from this uh, kind of adolescent stage where it's moving from film to digital to a more mature um, computational device, one that has code that can analyze the images, extract information, uh, and give you a lot of interesting information back. This is me using a piece of software from Fraunhofer, and this analyzes quite a few things. Uh, I can tell you that I'm angry, but maybe not quite, and my age is pretty you know, correct software a uh, demo is from 2009, so it's improved a lot over the years, and this technology is quite accurate. Now it's used in malls, so it can serve you up the correct ad as you walk by based on your, your gender, your age. Um, they can do more things like detect uh, you know, your hairstyle and figure out what kind of demographic you might belong to and your mood, so it knows really that you want that bottle of shampoo that's for sale. While I was thinking about this project, my friend did a Halloween costume, which is all makeup. This is not Photoshop. And it was really interesting, because I was, I was sure that it was Photoshop. And she had painted these eyes onto her head for a Halloween costume. It was so confusing that it was just a photo and that my psychology was deceived. And I wondered, what about face detection? Was it going to see a face in the same way that I did? And I ran this image through some programs and had no problem finding a face with four eyes. Uh, it met all the criteria for what a face should be, um, and eyes are only part of that. So then I began, uh, see if this works. So yeah, looking at other images with makeup and seeing how certain hairstyles or makeup patterns uh, may push a face over that threshold where it's no longer a face to a computer, but clearly a face to a human. And the initial, the initial tests were not um, motivating because you could have your face covered in makeup and it would still appear as a face. 
even um, partially obscuring a side of it and half of your face painted uh, still shows up as a face. These are photos from uh, the boombox party scene in London. And looking at these uh, and running them through programs is how I got a lot of the ideas that turned into uh, what eventually became a project I called CV Dazzle. And CV Dazzle is, um, the name comes from CV, computer vision, and Dazzle, which is a kind of camouflage that was used during World War I. It's a very bold, avant-garde style. When Picasso saw a tank decorated in Dazzle paint camo, uh, he said that they had stole Cubism from him and applied it to camouflage for military vehicles. What you see here is faces with test patterns, um, things that may be common like paint under the eyes for sports and showing how that may or may not work. These test patterns, I published them online. This is for my thesis back in 2010. And people were quite interested in this. So then uh, you know, I received positive feedback and kept working further on the project to try to develop a slightly more uh, practical, robust way of going about making you know, true camouflage. And in doing that, I spent a lot of work, a lot of time um, trying to understand what an algorithm sees. This is a visualization of what's called the Viola Jones algorithm. It's one of the most popular, widely used face detection algorithms. It's used for its speed. It can be put on embedded hardware. Um, and it's very CPU not intensive compared to newer algor algorithms. That said, it does have its weaknesses, which I've discovered in this project. And um, I'll describe what's happening here. I might need to replay this. You can see this window moving across an image in the white and black rectangles. Those are calculating the difference between the dark and light areas. And if, um, OK, this will make sense more in the next one. If that sum is within a threshold, then it counts it as a, a yes vote or a no vote. And it does that through what's called a classification tree. And if it makes enough uh, decisions in the yes direction, then it'll qualify that region as a possible face. And what's happening here, you can see these light rectangles. Uh, these are marking possible faces. And so many things appear as a possible face from the folds in your shirt to markings on a wall. So one challenge with face detection is being able to ignore all of those false positive signals. If you have enough overlapping uh, rectangles, then the confidence is pretty high, and you're able to discern that there's a face in that set of pixels. Those rectangles, when you break them out, look a little bit more like this. If you look at the one in the top left corner, you can see a good example here. So where the eyes are, you can have a darker area caused by the shadow from the forehead. And just below that, where the cheekbones are rising, it's going to catch light and be brighter. So the difference in pixel value from um, that shadowy area where your eyes are to the top of your cheekbones, is, it needs to meet a certain number, the sum of all those pixels. What you see here is maybe 30 um, sets of rectangles from approximately 1,000 or so that make up one profile. So it's quite uh, unrealistic to study all of them. But after looking at enough of these, you can see that trends emerge. And the key with any kind of uh, camouflage in an algorithmic sense is that detection is a probabilistic determination. If you can find the threshold of what that face detection algorithm is looking for, then all you need to do is figure out how to get one step below that. Camouflage, in an uh, algorithmic sense, exists beneath a certain threshold. And if we look at this in a um, bar graph, we can see that these stages, they're very cursory in the beginning, and they're not getting very much information. As they move closer to determining it, that it's a face, then it's doing more analysis and it's requiring more criteria to get into stages 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Once you reach st uh, stage 22, then um, it's going to mark it as a face. If you can get to stage 21, then it's no longer a face. 
So you don't have to do, you don't have to completely cover your face, you only have to find stage 21. Going further with trying to see how this algorithm was seeing, I used a genetic algorithm, uh, which is kind of a, a hill climb algorithm, to attack face detection's algorithm um, by keep trying different examples of what could possibly be a face. Every time a set of pixels matched what was a face, then I would um, save that image as a reference. After about 200 generations, I took all these images and then did a pixel average. So basically 200 images um, compressed into one. That's what you see on the right side. That is the face that is inside of um, OpenCV's face detection profile. It's totally creepy. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that it kind of um, you know, resembles what you'd expect, especially with the, the cheekbone areas, and even that slight shadow just to the side of the cheekbone. Now, knowing what the face detection algorithm is looking for is exactly what I needed to know to go about making um, a disguise for that. And after quite a bit of trial and error, I came up with a solution, and in collaboration with this magazine, in New York made a couple examples of how this could look. Here's one which uses a few tactics. I have a slide with some tips for you on, on how to go about this. <laughs> What's happening here is you're covering the nose. Maybe I'll go back. You can see that the nose, it's symmetrical. It's kind of the um, center line of a face. And a nose is always going to be in the middle. So if you can change that, expected kind of tonal gradient where it's supposed to go from a light area to a darker area and inverse that. Now, a nose is supposed to be catching light because it has a volumetric shape. What you're doing with the hair is you're, you're covering that. And some other important parts of this are that it's asymmetrical. In the case of the OpenCV algorithm, it is looking for symmetry between the left and right sides of the face. And here, um, it's going against that expected desired symmetry from the algorithm. In the results, you can see that it's pretty effective compared to the number of um, detections. And these are including all of the detections for what a face could be, um, going from maybe uh, 20 or so on the bottom uh, and 30 on the bottom left to about 2 and 1 on the left side. So it's really, um, it's really you know, existing beneath that threshold. This was another look I developed. So this one has more makeup. It's kind of a balance between using makeup and hair. And not everybody wants to use makeup, understandably. Um, so being able to do it with just hair is an important part of the project, as well as that this is not requiring you to go out and buy a technology. It's using hair uh, and makeup. And those are basically free. You have, <clears throat> in this case, um, I'm using OpenCV. But some of the looks also work against more sophisticated algorithms, which are backed by hundreds of millions of dollars. When you have a technology that costs that much money and you're beating it with maybe $1 worth of supply, it's a really good feeling. <laughs> this is how it looks on men. You can use uh, colored hair, um, kind of inserted, woven into your hair or this more uh, 3D spiky avatar look with pixelated camouflage. The key, though, going back to why fashion is important, is that you notice none of these looks are the same. If I were to make one look and simply repeat that, all somebody would need to do is figure out a profile for that look, and then it, the project would be done. What's important is that no look is the same as any other look, and the the possible space of looks is infinite, uh, including makeup, face shape, skin color, including accessories, turtlenecks, collars, hats, sunglasses, facial hair, unique hairstyles. And fashion is always changing, so the, the toolbox of looks is always going to change. This is just the output for one of the different looks. Last year, uh, I received a commission request from the New York Times to do one of these looks. And this was a great opportunity for me to point out something that IARPA has been working on. It's a program called 
Janus. And this was recently revealed in one of the NSA uh, revelation slides about the I2 intelligence program, which the NSA is collecting what's called media in the wild. It's taking what that translates to is every possible um, image that could be used for a biometric profile is taken. And that's also what um, the program Janus uses, except that Janus is public. It's a part of IARPA, uh, which is the information side of DARPA. It's especially daunting to me to know that a program is actively seeking any available image set and will use this to um, build a profile in order to biometrically identify people. And this isn't limited to visible light. Um, originally, the title for this talk was to uh, explore the electromagnetic spectrum. And Janus is doing that. Janus is doing that by taking the short wave, medium wave, and long wave infrared images, fusing these together with facial images. Um, I mean, facial images are just one small point part of a larger biometric profile, which includes, to some degree, um, every possible uh, data point, including your heart rate, including your health, determining that um, by a kind of uh, skin analysis or um, vein analysis, and that's done efficiently using these infrared type cameras. So that's all being funneled into this program, and I was very happy to call that out, and I hope some people um, took note of that. In this image, it's getting a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more decorated as well. This one is attacking, uh, in particular, uh, Neurotech face detection program, Apple's face detection, and OpenCV, as well as eBLearn. So that's easily a couple hundred million dollars worth of software. This one was $10, though. Some of the tips that I can give you for constructing a look, and these are mostly aimed at OpenCV, but there are a few new tips that have been discovered. Like I mentioned, being able to block the nose bridge area is particularly effective for OpenCV. Um, it's important that you bring the, the bangs down, though, far enough over the nose and are able to cover, modify, change that nose bridge shape. Another thing you can do to lower the probability of being detected is to use a makeup method called decontouring. So typical makeup enhances facial features, and actually that makes it easier for an algorithm to detect your face. When you darken your eyes or emphasize your lips, those are all the expected features that face detection is looking for. So here um, with CV Dazzle, you do the opposite of that. Um, and you can do that with asymmetry, too. So a face should be symmetrical, do the opposite. Uh, cheekbone should be light, uh, do the opposite. There's another research paper that came after this one from University of Texas, and they figured out that also the elliptical shape of a, for of a head um, increases the probability of being detected. So if you can somehow modify that with the way your hair is done or accessories, then you can dodge even more. A funny thing happened while I was working on these projects, which is that they began to appear in a number of academic research papers about how to make face detection better. And they would specifically cite my project in the references. And I wasn't too happy uh, that my work was leading to more research to make algorithms better. But that's how counter-surveillance works. Then, uh, in last year, 2013, I uh, received a request from 60 Minutes to include my work. The audio in here is really bad. And exponentially Thanks. cheaper. Yet facial recognition technology is still a work in progress. While investigators in the Boston Marathon bombing had multiple images of both suspects, the technology did not come up with a match. They were not identified by their faces, but by their fingerprints. Authorities won't say what went wrong. One possibility is that government data banks through which the photos would have been searched are not big enough. As we discovered, the FBI is working on expanding its database. Businesses are tapping facial recognition to sell us stuff. 
and computer scientists are upgrading the technology. The story will continue in a moment. In the sense that you might face, it does not walk around with a tag. This is Joseph Attic. He's the pioneer of face recognition. Not just on linking our faces on the street to our names, but to our online profiles with our personal data and shopping history. We used to worry about privacy on the web. Now we have to worry about privacy just walking around. The link is between the online and offline persona is yeah. becoming possible, and that... Because of our faces. Right, because of our faces, exactly. <laughs> Security cameras ever present. Some people are already thinking up countermeasures. Artists, very clever artists, have now be began to create new forms of anonymity by creating patterns that would interfere with face recognition algorithms. So they can go down the street and this system cannot recognize them. We'll all wear masks. The veil will come here. The veil might come here. Short of So it's an interesting lead in to my next project. What I was talking about with CV Dazzle, that's primarily existing in the visible light spectrum. And typically when we think of a camera, we think of that in the sense that it's recording visible light in the same frequencies that our eyes are responsive to. But there are cameras that span the whole range of frequencies from X-ray, UV, near-infrared, short-wave infrared, medium-wave infrared, medium infrared, thermal, long wave, and microwave. These are the cameras that are currently in development and in use by the military for more sophisticated purposes. An example of what that would look like is this. I think it's funny that we call this a camera while we also call um, you know, a more conventional point-and-shoot thing a camera. It's a really different categories, but they're all related by the term camera. Okay, this camera and similar technology like this is regulated by ITAR. ITAR is a set of rules and regulations that prohibit uh, materials or technology from crossing borders. It's a part of national defense. Some of these cameras are regulated by ITAR, um, basically classifying them as a type of a weapon or an information weapon. I think that's a better way to think of them, uh, especially in this case. So this is a, pointing out some of the more you know, drastic uses of this technology, but the ones that I was focusing on in this project, which I'm going to show, called Stealthware, if this video... Please. I'm going to talk over it. It's uh, a little bit daunting. What's happening is a uh, uh, combat aircraft is being used to target a person. That person is being identified using thermal vision. Thermal vision is really um, effective because you can't hide from it. You can go inside of a forest. You can hide behind a bush. Um, you can hide behind uh, even uh, fabric, and your heat will still be emitted. Because your body is a light bulb in the viewfinder of a thermal camera. It's going to skip ahead. Anyway, it's a very um, useful technology to military. And what you see happening there is very likely to be used domestically with drones being flown overhead. And that kind of technology being used to target someone on the ground. If there's no way to hide from that, um, well, there is. And it's very hard to um, just at least have the psychological um, surety that you won't become a white dot in a viewfinder. Uh, the thing that really bothers me about it is that it's a very effective way to automate those technologies because it is difficult to hide from the way that it's used is you, you lock on to a heat signature. We all know, you know the term heat-seeking missiles. Being able to lock on to a heat emitter it's an effective way to track it or launch munitions. So what I decided to do is figure out a way to hide from that. And I did research for materials and found one that's made of a kind of nickel-plated thread uh, interwoven with a silver coating on it. And this is reflective to heat, the same way that a space blanket is reflective to heat. The important thing is that nobody's going to wear a space blanket because it's absolutely um, crunchy and ridiculous. <laughs> but these garments flow like silk, and they're made, one side is the metal, and one side is silk. There's a hijab, a hoodie, and a burqa. That's part of the collection. 
And they're all inspired by um, the location that drones are currently used, um, purposely merging cultures, conflicting ideas about fashion and technology. The centerpiece of the collection is the anti-drone burqa, and this is the most effective one in the collection because it provides the most coverage. This is a test for the hijab. After I exhibited these in January of 2013, there was um, a good deal of press, and some news agency created this 3D uh, <laughs> news piece of the items from the stealthware, which was quite great. And it's a good explanation of how it works. This was another project that was in that exhibition, blocking airport x-ray scans. And this is great. Um, it's basically how it works. <laughs> so that's the, the 3D rendering. And now I'm going to show you what that actually looks like. Look closely at this image, and there are four people in it. One of them is wearing anti-drone burqa. And I'll give you a hint that she's in the middle of the frame. Now I'll play it. It'll be very clear. You can see her moving. The legs are a dead giveaway. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit intentional. So these, these projects were getting quite a bit of interesting uh, press, and my inbox was quite an interesting place to read. One of the emails I received after that project was a request to publish the earlier project in a classified intelligence document, which is weird, because <laughs> do you really need my permission? I'm never going to see it. <laughs> but it bothered me. Um, to not exactly know what was happening to my work and thinking that these are not my intended audiences. What I want to do is be able to bring this, these ideas to people who are going to implement them as real items and get them out there into the world, make counter-surveillance a much more normal thing, make privacy a more normal thing. So in response to that email is how I came up with the idea for the Privacy Gift Shop. And after that email is when I set up the meeting with the curator. The privacy gift shop is what I'm working on now. And this project, I think, is important because I'm developing these counter-surveillance items, which previously were, were quite you know, um, weird to some people, would put them in the category of paranoia. That paranoia has become more normalized now. You know, skip ahead. That, uh, when we think of a camera, this is what we should be thinking of. But this kind of information doesn't always get out to the public in time uh, before it's actually used overhead. Briefly, this is the camera that DARPA has developed. What's important to know about it is that it does 1.8 billion pixels, 1 million terabytes a day, and it can do that at a resolution of 6 inches from 17,000 feet. When you know that this camera is overhead, which you won't, <laughs> you only know that it may be, then you can learn, you can begin to kind of adapt to your environment. So this is how I see, this is my justification for why counter surveillance is important. Um, it's just a way to adapt to the environment around you. The environment is mass surveillance. It's filled with cameras or monitoring devices that use this information um, for not always your benefit and empowering somebody else who's doing the surveillance. I like to think of it this way. This quote is from Roy Behrens, a camouflage historian who says that deception and camouflage are part of who we are. It always has been that way, and it always will be that way. Now, taking a look at what the current technology um, is being used for. Here's a slide from a defense industry expo that I recently attended. Raytheon is a provider of a lot of military technology. They're looking at that full electromagnetic spectrum, and they're doing what's called multispectral fusion, hyperspectral fusion. 
it's not possible to set up cameras at all of these frequencies and then tunnel them into one algorithm that's able to analyze all this information. And like I said, it's so powerful that it has to be regulated at the border. So with the privacy gift shop, what I want to do is be able to kind of relay this information that I think is important and then um, connect people with technology, privacy enhancing technology or provocations that make it approachable, that bring it into our environment so we can begin to adapt to that environment. Uh, it's called a gift shop because gift shops are a friendly place and a lot of this technology is not, um, it's kind of scary. One of the projects that's in there right now is this item, which is a Faraday cage phone case. Um, it's the top seller in the privacy gift shop. Basically what that does, um, it, it blocks all of the phone signals from going out from your phone or coming into the bag. So it's able to block anybody, any agency, um, any person from eavesdropping onto your phone or hacking it. Now this video, ooh, got two great videos here. This is from he he's not paranoid, but 2009. And this is how people received my work in 2009. The New York technologist by prefacing it that right it exists somewhere in relation to paranoia. For uh, five years later, privacy is on the front page of newspapers almost every day. Um, it's not about paranoia, it's about being practical, it's about understanding what governments are doing and how they're using that information. So, now, what I want to end with is that when we look at advertisements like this, which show a technology that will soon likely be positioned overhead dense urban areas, uh, quite frightening too, <laughs> is that um, we shouldn't be distracted by the, the technological wizardry of these projects. Uh, that instead, we should think about how we can use this level of innovation, science and engineering, for purposes that are going to make the, the future suck less and will help us adapt to environments that have mass surveillance, uh, improve privacy. Opinions are changing. This is Eric Schmidt in 2009, a quote that we're all familiar with. And I think that quote was rolled out about 2001. So it took 13 years to realize that that's bullshit. In 2014, Eric Schmidt is saying, you're going to have to fight for it. Uh, another statistic to end with is that people have become fed up with this. 54% of people between age 18 to 34 in the US have stopped using products because they were worried about the way it was using their personal information. There are a lot of other artists and um, innovators working in this area, and I'll point you to a good reference that Kyle McDonald has started on the ArtSec uh, mailing list. Yeah, ArtSec bibliography has a growing list of a lot of examples of this kind of work and this kind of thinking, and it's, it's critical to the time that we live in and being able to define what's happening right now by creating artwork that describes um, this very uh, interesting era that we're all living in. And that's what I'll end on. Thank you. Thank you.